thank you for the uh, introduction. Uh, who was here last time when I gave the seminar? Were you all here? Yeah? Anybody was not here? You are not here? Okay, so uh, the reason I'm asking is because last time I talked about the application of low temperature plasma in biology and medicine, and those applications became possible because we developed low temperature plasma devices, sources. So, so that was part two, if you like, and today is part one. It's actually the devices, because without the devices, uh, we, can, we, we would not have been able to do this uh, application in biology and medicine. So today I'm gonna talk about them, of course. <coughs> I only have, whatever, 45, 50 minutes. But this is, you know, it's a large field, so uh, I cannot cover everything. So I'm kind of condensed it and then put it together, hopefully in a way that uh, is um, understandable and uh, even if you are not an expert, kind of understand at least the, the, gist, the, the, the gist of it. So uh, let me, uh, uh, so I can advance the slide with this, you said? Yeah. This advanced the slide without yeah. going to the computer? Yeah, I, I think so. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Oh. I can use the computer. Just use the mouse? Yeah, I can use the mouse. It doesn't work. Okay. It's okay, don't worry about yeah. it. Don't worry, I don't have a lot of time, time, so I don't want to waste time doing this. So, uh, um, first I would like to acknowledge the uh, my uh, uh, students and postdoc who did a lot of work uh, uh, in the lab. Uh, so here I have a list of students and the postdoc that worked on some of the devices that we developed here at ODU, okay? Uh, this picture would be much better if there was no light. <laughs> but let me uh, uh, explain here. Uh, so I'm talking about plasma. Where I, hopefully all of you know what that is, but very quickly, you know, uh, there are... Uh, uh, four states of matter that we know of. Uh, there may be more, but that's it. Uh, four uh, solid uh, uh, and liquid. Uh, if you add energy to the solid, you can make it into a liquid. And then you heat the liquid and you get a gas. And then if you put more energy into the gas, you can ionize it and you make plasma. Uh, so plasma is kind of the fourth, they call it the fourth state of matter. It's probably the first state of matter because when the universe was made and the, during the Big Bang and all that matter was so hot that it probably was in the plasma state. And then when the, the universe expanded, it cooled off, and that's when you know, gas and liquid and solid were made. So, but, it's, but it is known as the uh, fourth state of matter. The reason I, I, I uh, selected that background, uh, most of my slides don't have a background, but this background is kind of a night sky, that's because the stars that you can see, you know, uh, uh, are in the plasma state, including our sun. So plasma is the, one of the most prevalent states of matter in the universe. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna distinguish a little bit since this is an introduction, especially for those who don't know. We can make thermal plasma and non-thermal plasma. Thermal plasma is a, what we call it, hot plasma, where all the particles are at the same uh, temperature or energy, so they are in equilibrium, uh, a, a thermal equilibrium. And the and example are arcs, uh, and like welding arcs, and, and fusion, nuclear fusion plasmas. And uh, non-thermal plasmas, what we call cold plasma, or I call it low temperature plasmas because you saw the title. Uh, those are non-equilibrium, that means the electrons are energetic, but the ions and the neutrals are cold. So you can touch them without getting burned. So those are the non-thermal plasma. So they are non-equilibrium because the uh, energy is not equilibrated. Uh, not all the particles have the same energy. And some examples are you know, glow discharges, and, um, and they are good for uh, material processing since they don't uh, burn what they touch. Uh, uh, also, uh, plasmas, you can make them either under reduced pressure or low pressure or high pressure. 
So low pressure plasmas, that's when you need a vacuum system. If some of you may be graduate students to work on uh, using uh, vacuum pumps and all that. So you need an enclosure and you need a vacuum pump and all that to uh, establish low uh, pressure. Uh, so uh, uh, those are the low pressure plasmas. The high pressure plasmas, by high pressure, you know, this is a kind of a relative term. For, uh, uh, for a plasma person, high pressure would be like atmospheric pressure, like this is high. We're not talking like hundreds of PSIs or anything like that. So that in, in our field, high pressure means when you get above uh, a few tens of Thor, Thor is the unit of measurement. A Thor is a millimeter of mercury of pressure. So that's, um, if you get many Thors or hundreds of Thors up to atmospheric pressure, we call those uh, high pressure plasma. Those who, that are made at atmospheric pressure, like in, in this room, uh, uh, you don't need in vacuum pumps, you don't need enclosures, so it makes it a lot more practical and economical, of course. This is a, uh, uh, this is not my plot, I, this is, I think everybody who gives a lecture to plasma shows this slide, that's a very uh, popular slide. But this slide, it shows you the temperature and the density, that's the number of particles per unit volume. And it shows you where everything fits, huh? So you can see, let me, let me get the, uh, all right, laser, yeah. laser. Maybe testing is this one. I think it is. The one. Okay. okay. So uh, the whole remote just for a laser pointer. Does it make <laughs> sense? There's like a million buttons on it. So, uh, uh, it, so where is it? Do you see it? Yes. I can yeah. hardly see it. So anyway, you can see, for example, uh, where the, um, I cannot even see it myself because there's no uh, good light. Uh, so this is the, the core of the sun would be here, which means it's very hot and very dense also. Uh, this is a f nuclear fusion device. It's even hotter than the sun, but less dense. And uh, lightning and the aurora borealis, uh, flames, you know, most flames. Are plasma, so there's a debate are they pl uh, a plasma or not. And uh, um, uh, neon light here. Uh, so uh, the plasmas that I'm going to talk about, they're going to be somewhere in here. Huh? So non equilibrium atmospheric pressure plasma, that's what I'm going to focus on. Uh, so the electrons are energetic, the uh, ions and the neutrons are not. And uh, the pressure uh, is atmospheric pressure, so we have a lot of collusions. You know, there's a lot of particles, so they collide with each other. Uh, the, uh, uh, we can generate a lot of chemical species, because uh, when you have energ energetic electrons, they will go and collide with the background molecules and atom and excite them and, and break them to, uh, uh, like, let's say if you have a um, a water molecule, H2O, can break it into OH and O. So, um, uh, so you can create chemical species. It also generates uh, radiation, uh, ultraviolet or vacuum ultraviolet. All right, and no vacuum system, as I said before, so it's simple to design, easy to operate, and less expensive. So, uh, what do, uh, what's inside these plasmas? Uh, first, there are electric fields, and uh, electric field can play a role in many applications, including biomedical applications. Uh, uh, as I said, they have electromagnetic radiation, including ultraviolet and vacuum ultraviolet. Uh, charged particles, electrons, and ions. And also, the reactive species, some of them are for a lot of application, especially if you use air, for example, uh, be oxygen and nitrogen, they will have oxygen-based uh, radicals, nitrogen-based radicals, and non-radicals. So plasmas, uh, we don't think about them a lot, but they are used in technology. Huh? So uh, the, in the automotive industry, in the lighting, in optics, in making papers, in clothing, like to dye, for example, clothes, and, uh, or, or to be able to uh, render plastics hydrophilic instead of hydrophobic, so you can write on them or, or print on them. They're used in the defense industry, aerospace, semiconductor, very important, because all the application that for uh, 
for semiconductor manufacturing. When you manufacture uh, integrated circuits and transistors and all that, it's all done within you know a plasma atmosphere. So so that you know, plasma environment. So very important in the semiconductor, uh, semiconductor industry. And recently, in the last maybe 20 years or so, we started doing application in biology and medicine. So I thought I'd show you this slide to show you where that plasma plays uh, a, a big role in a lot of industry. However, I also want to show you this slide because I want to show you that without plasma, what our world would be without it. Huh? So without low temperatures with plasma, our modern society would not be as modern. Why? Because without, without plasmas, we will have no laptops. We'll have no cell phones and no massively parallel computing because as I told you, all the computer chips are made by plasma de uh, devices. Uh, we'll have no high performance jet engines. We will have no high, high efficiency, uh, efficiency lighting, LED and LCDs and all that. We'll have no high performance optics. We'll have no solar cells. If you can ask the, the professor who teaches uh, photovoltaic here, they'll tell you they, uh, they do all that within a plasma environment. The, uh, no glass enclosed skyscrapers, no municipal scale ozone water purification, no saran wrap, right? <laughs> because that's how you can make, you know, uh, these are hydrophilic. Yeah. So, uh, or any other hydrophilic plastic, uh, no nanotechnology. That's a terrible world, wouldn't it be, without plasma, that, you know, that we are used to get, get it, take it for granted, all this technologies that we have around us. But those had to be manufactured, have to be made. And plasma happens to be the enabler. So that's why, you know, and, and, and by the way, if you don't have laptop and cell phones and massively compute, uh, parallel computing, we'll have no internet. But anyway, so, uh, so anyway, that guy's crying because that's not a good, a good uh, scenario, right? So, uh, uh, so what I'm going to talk about today, of course, as I told you, is a huge field. I'll concentrate on uh, the stuff that I worked on. So uh, uh, the sources, uh, I'm going to cover four of them, uh, uh, very important ones, obviously. The dielectric barrier discharge, I have a picture of it there to the right. The resistive barrier discharge right under it. Discharge uh, using water electrode, using water as an electrode. And then finally, I uh, spent more time on the plasma jets because of the, their importance in biomedical application, which I'm interested in. Huh? So let's talk about this device called the dielectric barrier discharge. This device, believe it or not, it was first discovered, this phenomenon, uh, by a French uh, uh, scientist by the name of uh, Dumont Cell. And it was 1855, long time ago. And he discovered that if you have two plate, uh, conducting plates, and you separate them with, with, you know, with glass, and, the, the, and you put a gap in between, if you put some electrical power, he saw suddenly something light inside. He called it like, a, I forgot, a blue rain or something like that. So he said it's bluish color. Suddenly it gets formed in there. And that is, uh, what the, this discovery is the basis of, the, uh, uh, of this uh, device. The, di the dielectric is the glass. And it's a barrier between the conductor and the other electrode. So that's why it's called dielectric barrier discharge. So the dielectric could be glass or quartz or any non-conducting material that will uh, isolate one, at least one of the electrode or both. So that discovery was made in 1855 and only two years later as a, a, a German uh, probably all heard of him because everybody knows the company Siemens so, and then Mr. Siemens actually used the dielectric barrier discharge to create ozone. Air has oxygen. So you can make, you know, oxygen is O2. But with the plasma, you can make O3. And that's what ozone uh, is. Uh, at, the, at those days, they didn't even know. But all they know is they smell this weird smell. Sometimes you smell it after a storm. That's because the lightning hits and activates the air. Air has oxygen. 
it becomes ozone and you can smell it. Huh? That's that, that, that typical smell after a storm. That's, a lot of it comes from the ozone. And you are, of course, everybody knows the ozone layer around the Earth to protect us from uh, ultraviolet. So he made ozone uh, using this, and then ozone was used to actually clean water. That's why a lot of municipal water treatment use ozone better than using chlorine. Uh, to, to kill all the contaminants, uh, biological contaminants. So that was two years later, 1857. So the first application was to make ozone using this dielectric barrier discharge. The latest application, uh, was a long time after that, 96, that's when we started doing this biological uh, uh, application because we discovered that plasma can kill bacteria efficiently. I have some pictures there showing, you know, a bacterial lawn of different types, and then after treatment with plasma, we kind of destroy all that, all, all those bacteria. Very important application, huh? to decontaminate and sterilize and things like that. So using 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 plasma, that was in '96, and the work is still going on to the present. All right. Now, there are different configurations. So this is kind of a show you all, all kind of uh, configuration. Here you can have the two electrodes, the top and the bottom. And then you have here, it's the barrier, which is the dielectric, like glass. And then you apply uh, usually AC power, in, most of the time in the kilohertz uh, frequency. And you apply high voltage, a few kilovolts at a few kilohertz. And you can ionize either the gas that you put in there, or even air itself. And so that's one configuration. You can put the dielectric right in the middle and make two discharges. You can use a cylindrical geometry, like, like Siemens, he used the cylindrical geometry. Uh, you can use just one barrier. You can use uh, you know uh, uh, that type of electrode on the surface. That way you can create a surface plasma. And uh, uh, anyway, so, so there are all these geometries that you can play with for whatever application you are interested in. Now we started studying this back in maybe let's say late eighties, early nineties, where we want to understand these plasmas better uh, made by the dielectric barrier discharge. This is all done at atmospheric pressure, huh? so no vacuum system. And most of the time, it makes a plasma that's called filamentary where you see filaments. The picture there, unfortunately, with the light, you don't see it very well, but you see brighter filaments in the middle. And, and actually, if you use a very fast camera, like the CC, ICCD, you can see the filaments huh, forming. That's the, those white, uh, 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 the, 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 these white filaments here. That's what um, we're talking about. So if you look at the IV characteristic, you see, uh, th this is the, uh, the voltage, which is a sine wave. And you will see that for all this filament, you see all these spikes of current. So the current looks like, like that. Hmm? That's, that's because of the filamentary structure. So just by looking at the current, looking at the oscilloscope, you can tell it's filamentary when you see all these uh, uh, different spikes of, uh, of current. Now, under some condition, we can make it nice and diffuse, smooth, no filaments. And when uh, you can see with the, uh, with the fast camera, it, instead of you seeing all, seeing all these filaments, you see the plasma ignites everywhere. And then, of course, it will fill the whole volume. And if you look at the current, suddenly there is not all this many, many spikes of current. You see one kind of exponentially decaying uh, current with a, with, a, with a peak here. So that's how the IV characteristic of the, uh, of the diffuse uh, discharge or diffuse plasma look like. This is all the same device. Huh? There are other operating conditions where actually you can play with the power and the pressure, and you can make what they call them self-organized. And they form in a, in a, in a, in a, in a the plasma organizes itself in different forms. So some of them are very spectacular, actually. But this is just an example uh, from this particular paper here. 
uh, uh, how you can get this, what's called the self-organization. So you can get the filamentary regime, you get the diffuse, or you can get the self-organization. This is helpful in some application, like for example, making UV uh, uh, lamps and things like that. Um, so when we have a plasma, uh, especially if you are not in the field, uh, some of you are not, uh, what do we do uh, to study them? Well, there are very uh, many parameters we wanna uh, we wanna measure. We wanna measure, for example, the electron temperature and density. And we have methods. We use interferometry, microwave interferometry. We use uh, spectroscopic method uh, called the spark broadening, where we can actually get the what's the density of the how many electrons are we making and what and what their energies are. Uh, we can measure the gas temperature. These are low temperatures, so we want to be at room temperature. So this will tell us. Uh, we can use spectroscopy. This is a non-intrusive method. You just collect the light, and it tells you, uh, you know, f following certain methods, uh, what the temperature is. You look at the rotational structure of some molecule uh, and it, or, or some atom. It tells you. Uh, we measure. Uh, we identify what are the species we are making. It, like I said, like atomic oxygen or OH or things like that, we can uh, use a, a spectroscopy emission, optical emission spectroscopy to see that. But we also can measure, actually, not just qualitative, but quantitative measurements. We can use laser-induced fluorescence method, absorption spectroscopy, titration, things like that to measure the concentration of whatever species we are interested in. And we can also measure the electric field. Uh, there are spectroscopic methods. I'm going to show you a couple of them later. Uh, you can use uh, probes. You can use uh, uh, BSO crystal, uh, bismuth silicon oxide crystal that has the pocket effect. Pocket effect means the refractive index changes uh, proportional to the electric field. So if you measure the change in your refractive index, you can tell how much electric field you have. So anyway, these are methods. Uh, you can also measure the power. We are very interested when you apply the power, we want to measure how much power you put in. For this particular device, we use something called the Lissajous plot, where you can, uh, using this circuit, you can plot the uh, voltage versus the, the, um, uh, the, the charge because it looks like a capacitor, right? The, uh, the plasma is just two electrodes and separated by dielectric. That's a capacitor. And then uh, if you plot that area in this, uh, parallelogram that will be actually the power that you uh, 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 transfer to the plasma itself, not the total power. Uh, the total power, you multiply the voltage by the current from the source. This is the plasma absorbed by the, by, uh, the uh, power absorbed by the plasma, which is very important because not all of it will go to the plasma, as, as hopefully you all know. Uh, I cannot go on and on because I would run out of time. I have so much to cover. But I, for those interested, when you watch this video, uh, you have time to look at the slide. Uh, I mentioned a lot of papers here, all the way from '90 to 2017, that will talk about this particular device called the dielectric variable discharge. And you, there are some really nice uh, review papers in there that will uh, that will teach you about this device if you are interested. Now, uh, at one time, we had the idea that. How about if we want to increase the number of electrons that we make, and in the, which makes uh, and get them a little more energetic so we can get more uh, reactive species generated uh, instead? So it turned out that if you use pulses instead of a sine wave, it works much better. Uh, so uh, that, that's why I call this pulsing the discharge, because um, the idea of using these pulses is not new. It's all uh, was used long time ago by people working on gas lasers. However, for atmospheric pressure plasmas that we are working on, that uh, started only worked somewhere around the early 2000s, and I, and I put here four early papers that will discuss the application of using pulses instead of sine waves to make the discharge even more intense, if you like. Um, so why do we pulse a discharge? Uh, short pulses with faster ice time transfer the energy directly to the electron. The electrons are small, so they don't have so much inertia. So they can gain that uh, energy while the, uh, the, the ions and the neutral are heavy. They, they're not fast. So most of the energy goes into the electron. 
uh, that will shift the, uh, uh, this is the electron energy distribution function will shift it toward the high energies, which is what we want. That will cause enhanced chemistry. And we discovered that is, you, for every pulse, you don't just get one discharge, you get two. You get a kind of a bonus discharge. Well, uh, the first ignites at the, at the rise of the pulse, and the second one ignites at the fall of the pulse. We didn't know that. Huh? So, uh, so here is a, uh, a picture of the pulse DVD, and you can see here, this is the pulse, this is the, the voltage pulse, and this is the current. And so you can see that first peak of current, that's the first discharge, and then the second peak of current, being the second discharge at the falling edge of the, uh, of the voltage. And you can see the difference between the, this is sinusoidal versus pulse. Even, even just looking at it with your naked eye, you can tell the pulse one is more intense, uh, but that's more or less light. So uh, what's important is the number density. You can see the electron number density is between 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 10 for the sinusoidal one, but you increase it maybe 100 times fold by uh, two order of magnitude if you use the pulse. And, the, and also the pulse helps the, keep the temperature low. And here is a uh, plot of the uh, uh, electron energy distribution function with increasing uh, reduced field, uh, the electric field divided by the density. And you can see how it's shifting toward the high energies. The energy that we use in our field is the electron volt. Electron volt is 1.6 10 to negative 19 joule. So it's a very tiny piece of a joule, but uh, we don't want to use joule, so we use electron volt. That way we can use small numbers. Um, all right, so the, the power that we put into this uh, pulse discharge, you, we can measure it, obviously, because we can measure the, you know, the voltage and the current. And you can see here, uh, the, uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, by the way, the square thing here, that's the pulse. And then I plotted two things. One is the power coming from the power supply and the power that goes into the plasma, which is P gas. And you can see for the power supply, you have here and then you have a negative one there. That's, that means power being returned to the source. So you get a second discharge without spending energy. Right? I'll tell you why later. And then, uh, the, the, this is the power in the gas, this peak and that peak there. So you get two, two uh, discharges for the price of one, just with one pulse. And I have pictures here, uh, you know, just, just to show you, so you don't get bored with the equation of the work and plots. This is a picture to show you uh, we can make uh, the discharge in helium, in neon, in argon, and they all have different colors because each gas will have, you know, different excitations, so different wavelengths that will be emitted. Uh, neon is always a little redder. Unfortunately, with this lighting, the color doesn't show very well. But uh, but in real life, in the lab, it was really nice and spectacular to see. All right, so uh, I talked about the dielectric barrier discharge that uses AC, huh? usually in the kilohertz. And then I told you about you can improve it using the pulses. However, back, you know, I don't know, no, 15 years ago or so, we had the idea that, you know, we, how about if we want to use low, either low frequency, like wide frequency, 60 hertz, or just DC. So uh, obviously DC is not going to work with the dielectric barrier discharge because DC doesn't go through a dielectric. So we came up with the idea of replacing the dielectric with a high resistivity material, which would play a role like a ballast resistor. And, and, that, and we call that the resistive barrier discharge. So all we did is we took the dielectric and, and changed it by a high uh, uh, resistance material. So that way uh, we can actually drive it with 60 hertz or DC, like that picture there. That discharge there, as I think it was done with 60 hertz. Um, it simplifies a lot because it, you're all electrical engineers. If you to make kilovolts, because the voltage that you need here is a, it's not like you know 20 volt or 100 volt. You need usually kilovolts, 
to make kilovolts at kilohertz is not a trivial problem. But, but to make kilovolt at 60 hertz, all you do is just buy yourself a transformer. <laughs> That's it. And step up transformer, and it works. But uh, uh, the if you look at the transfer function of a normal transformer, it's not going to go to the kilohertz. That's why you have you need special transformer to actually, you know, uh, uh, have a step up transformer at the kilohertz range. But at 60 hertz, it's no problem. So, uh, so we, uh, uh, for practicality, we develop this uh, resistive barrier discharge, and because the 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 uh, of that high resistivity, the current is never allowed to get very high, which is good because when the current is allowed to go high, that's when usually we, we call them a restriction, the plasma restricts and become like an arc. And then suddenly the fuse in your power supply just blows and it can't keep up. Or it becomes like a, a just a, if you have a good power supply that can supply amperes, then you, uh, you end up just a, you know poking a hole into, the, into your electrode and causing a fire. <laughs> So, uh, uh, but with the high resistivity material, we can keep the current very low. And, and we found out that even when we apply DC, the current is still pulsed. Because what happens is when, when, the, um, when the discharge is ignited, a lot of the voltage drops across the resistance. So there is not enough voltage to make the plasma anymore. So the current becomes pulsed. It's on and then, and then it's like a feedback. It kills itself. And then after a while, it, uh, it, it turns on again. And then as soon as the current goes up, the voltage across the gas drops and the current dies out. So, so you end up with a, what we call self-pulse current, even under DC voltage drive. Anyway, there's this, a lot of people use this nowadays, the resistive barrier discharge. That was a good idea that we worked on back uh, uh, Another thing is we... Uh, we studied uh, uh, discharges over liquids. And there was a reason why, because we, I would, personally I was interested in uh, uh, using application in biomedical, and if you're gonna use it for medicine, you know, there's always fluids and liquids. Right? So even if you have, you know, if you treat a wound, or if you treat whatever, blood, it's all in the liquid state. So, it's very important to study the interaction of the plasma with liquids. So we, first we started, of course, just with a simple liquid, which is water. Uh, and it turns out to be very complicated because, you know, uh, you have the gas phase chemistry combined with the liquid phase chemistry. It, get, it gets very compl uh, complicated very quickly. The, uh, the idea of, uh, I mean, some people studied interaction of plasma with liquids all the way back in the 50s. Um, uh, we did some work in the early 2000s, but then the field just blew up at the maybe around 2008, 2010, until now because of relevance to a lot of application. When, when, whenever you do something that has relevance to a thing application, suddenly people are interested. When you do it just for scientific curiosity, like only the, only the sci scientists and curious people uh, will will you know want to know about it? But as as soon as there is an application, and you know there's money, <laughs> then people suddenly get interested, and then people start studying it more and more. Okay, so so uh, uh, the field took off kind of uh, uh, with uh, the studying the interaction of plasma with liquids, uh, and now it's really uh, 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 there's a whole you know, research community that uh, look into that. And there is a lot of application in, pro in uh, processing, uh, material processing, environmental application, and medical application. So it's a very important to study the interaction of, uh, of plasma with liquid. Let me tell you our early work. At the time, we were doing it just for, you know, scientific curiosity back in early 2000s. So we did two experiments. One, we had we had the, the, the electrode embedded in liquid, so only the surface of the liquid uh, will interact with, the, with this uh, metal electrode, and we generate the plasma in the gap here. And we had another experiment where actually the liquid is moving. So here, static versus liquid that's moving. And we studied that at the time. We just wanted to know, you know what, 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 what would happen and what can be measured. 
Here's, here's the experiment that we built here. Uh, in our nice machine shop down here. So, uh, so this is the one where the liquid uh, is moving. And you can see a nice picture of the plasma, which is in here, that's the plasma. It's, uh, we don't put any gas, it's just air, just the room air. Uh, so, so of course we do uh, a lot of diagnostic, which means measurements. So we, we measure, we use you know, fast cameras, oscilloscopes, and the spectrometers, and what have you, to find out what's going on in that, in that plasma. So we discovered a few things, very interesting things. We did, that we didn't know. Maybe some people, other people knew about it a lot. We didn't know it. Uh, when, when the, because we use uh, a sine wave, so sometimes the water is anode, sometimes it's cathode. We found out when the, uh, the, the by the way, the water, uh, the water electrode is, is at the bottom one, and the metal electrode is on top. We found that um, when the water electrode is cathode, uh, we, we see multiple ignitions of, and this is with the fast camera because if you don't use fast camera all you see is that you see a nice bright color but that doesn't tell you anything because your eyes just integrate everything so we want to know what happened at a very very short times so like in microsecond or nanosecond so we take fast uh, using fast camera take shots like that we found there is multiple ignition, and it turns out that actually when you apply because of the electric field, you, there is an instability developed at the surface of the water, and suddenly you create these ripples, like waves. And whenever there is anything sharp, that's where it ignites the most, because the electric field is highest at sharp points. Huh? So we found that when the, uh, water, uh, when the water electrode is cathode, we have multiple ignition, however, when the sine wave becomes positive and the water electrode is anode, we found we find this is the typical, well known, you can find it in any book, structure of what's called the glow discharge. So you have a glow discharge, usually I don't know how many people took plasma here, of course. It has, you know, something called the negative glow, which is which is very bright, the brightest of all. And then there is dark space in between, and then there is a, a long uh, positive column. So this is called a glow discharge. So when the water electrode is anode, then you get uh, this nice typical uh, uh, discharge, a glow discharge. Uh, I don't want to really, I, I don't know, maybe I should skip this slide. This is just calculations that we made about about the density and its distribution uh, in time and in, and in the radial position. Uh, uh, we did this using spectroscopic methods, but I don't want to get into too much into that because I have, I have a lot to go and time is almost up. Uh, we looked at the emission spectra. We found a lot of OH. Why? In the water, right? We're going to get a lot of OH. So we measured, actually, if the, the blue thing here shows you the OH uh, is as a function of time, so we generate a high density of excited OH, and this is the transition from the A to the to the ground. Um, uh, so anyway, you can study what other things you make, like uh, nitrogen and uh, and uh, ionic nitrogen N2 plus, and uh, this will tell you you know what's what's inside your plasma. Uh, uh, if you are interested, uh, I again go and look at the slides, and there are some nice uh, review papers published in 2009, 2016, and there are some other ones that I added here. This will tell you a lot about this because there is a whole, like I said, research effort going on on using plasma with liquids. Uh, that, that requires a whole lecture by itself. So let me, let me switch very quickly. This is actually what I really want to talk about, which is the low-temperature plasma jets. Uh, these are jets that can uh, be launched in air, so you can touch them, you can reach them. Uh, they are not inside, it's uh, an enclosure. And we can, you can generate them using all kind of power supplies from DC all the way to microwave. Uh, we, we use pulse DC in my lab um, because as I told you, we like the pulse system. Uh, uh, 
device, you can make it, uh, this is handheld, especially if you're gonna use it for medical application, you wanna be able to, to hold it and apply it. And uh, again, it can be used for biomedical application. So um, there are a lot of configuration. Uh, the, com the first configuration that we came up with was this one here, and then we developed more like this one, but other people started coming up with their own configuration. And I, uh, these are, you know, look at them later if you are interested. I put as many configuration I can, uh, that I can think of. Here's more. So people started, you know, being creative and coming up with all kind of uh, tools. Uh, uh, what happened here is the main thing is what you should know, we go back to our device here, is we, we generate the plasma inside the chamber here, and then we shoot it out. Huh? So it comes out. A lot of people did, didn't think that was possible. Maybe if it's hot plasma, yes, that's w w very well established. They call it plasma torches. Uh, but that, you can touch it, it'll just you know, burn, you, you melt your whole, uh, your whole hand. But to have it low uh, you know, temperature where you can touch it and not get electrocuted or nothing, you know, uh, that, that was kind of a little bit of a dream, but, but we were able to, uh, to do it, and now it, everybody has their own jet of different kinds. Uh, so, so here are a picture of some of the ones we developed back in between 2004 and 2006. They have the plasma pencil, we made micro pencils, we made a, a, a jet that, that uh, plasma follow a thin capillary tube and come out at the end of the tube. There's a lot of applications that want that. So, uh, so the, these are plasmas, by the way, you can touch huh? with your bare hand and it doesn't burn you. Um, so this is our plasma pencil, uh, that's the design, and you can see that typical, you know, we have pulse, and you have first discharge, second discharge at the, at the falling edge. Uh, so we want to study them. So my first thing when I, see, when I saw it, and I said, wow, I, I got I to look at, with a flash camera to see how they form. How, how is this thing just, you know, the plasma is inside, it just goes outside. I, I did, uh, I'd never seen that before, I wanted to study it. So we used the flash camera and we, and we looked at it and we found out that it's actually not like you see it with your naked eye. It's, uh, there, there are, they call them plasma bullets. That, are, that device like a gun shoots bullets of, of plasma, but because it's so fast, you see them, you know, you, you see it as a continuous uh, plasma plume. But in reality, they are bullets. So we, we, we discovered them here at ODU, but we didn't know there was another group in Germany at the same time, it was all in 2005, that uh, they also saw the same thing. So uh, then we studied them more and we found out they are actually ionization waves, they call them guided ionization waves, but that came later. But the observation was done back, and I'm gonna show you a little movie here, I hope it works, yeah. So here is what you see with your naked eye. You see, you see the plasma like that. But in reality, you can see it when you look at it with a fast camera. It shoots like a, like that. That's why I call it, we call it bullet. And then it goes. And then after a while, it just dies out. And I, and I'll tell you later why it dies out if I have time. It's okay. So that's. Do you want to see it one more time, or should we move? We don't have time. But uh, but uh, anyway, that was. Uh, that was in 2005 when I looked at that. I thought that was uh, really neat, you know. That, uh, uh, but because you, you you see it, you know, with your naked eye, you never think it's actually. But but for every pulse now, you're gonna shoot that, and we do it at kilohertz. So that's why we see it as a continuous. Okay. Uh, so we we wanted to understand what what is that. So uh, we had to come up with the, the physics, the explanation how how these bullets work. So uh, uh, we published paper in 2006 where we studied this here and we proposed a method based on what's called photoionization, but I don't want to get uh, too much into that because I think uh, we're most out of time. Uh, uh, so that was uh, in 2006 and you can spend, then we measured the velocity of these bullets and they're fast. They go up to maybe 100 kilometers per second. They are very fast. And uh, uh, so you see here, and, and, uh, they, as, they, as they move uh, you know, along the axis and then they die out, um, 
And uh, so during this phase here, we call it the launching phase. That's when you launch it, how it looks like, and what's the velocity. This is the propagation phase what, with the velocity, and that's the ending or dying phase of it. Um, maybe I should skip this one. I, I'm going to skip this one because I don't have time. We, I also wanted to know the structure. So we looked at it head on, and we found that when it starts, it's actually hollow. It's not a ring like a donut. It's not even continuous. When you look at it on the side, you can see that, right? But when you look at it head on, there's that. And then, of course, as it travels, it collapses, and it, be and it becomes less hollow and then not hollow at all. No? So uh, that was interesting to find that. We verified that with, uh, with, uh, <coughs> with emission spectroscopy. You can see um, a different location, two centimeters, three, four centimeters. Uh, at at, uh, at two centimeters, you can see there is the, uh, uh, there's light here and here. That's at the edge because it's a donut at the two edges. In the middle, it's hollow. Of course, if you do the able inversion, it, it, you really see how hollow it is. I'm not sure if you're all familiar with the able inversion. Uh, but, and, and then as you move out up to, let's say, four centimeters, suddenly it, it's not hollow anymore. That's why I showed you that picture where they, it's not a donut anymore. Uh, you can look also, we looked at it with uh, 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 modeling, you know, uh, so uh, uh, you can see here, this is the, the density of electron, the density of the nitrogen, and you, you see the, uh, at one centimeter, that's close to the nozzle, it's on the edge here, and then as it moves on, it goes more and more toward the center, and the same thing with the, with the uh, N2. I am hurrying because I don't have, how much time do I have left? Ten minutes, okay. Uh, okay, maybe I should skip this. Oh, maybe I should talk about it a little bit. This is we we. Uh, uh, by the way, this is all modeling. You know? This is all uh, simulation. The um, um, uh, we look at all the important species like uh, helium metastables, electrons, uh, nitrogen, uh, uh, and uh, we look at it at tw uh, twenty meter, two centimeter, and four centimeter. This is the end here of the device, and we measure here and there, and you can see uh, all these species here, their densities, and as you move four centimeter, they all disappear because they get quenched by air. So uh, this is a device that uses helium gas, by the way. Maybe I neglected to say that. So we are we are uh, you're driving it with helium. Uh, okay, maybe I should skip that. Uh, we also found out that depending on, I'm sure you all know about Reynolds number and all that. Huh? So uh, depending on the, on the uh, average flow velocity of the gas, in our case was helium, you, uh, the, you can operate it at the laminar flow and then there is a transition <coughs> period that becomes very turbulent. When it becomes turbulent, it doesn't work very well. And it becomes short too. So uh, here's just a few pictures to show you. <coughs> Different uh, flow of the helium, and you see when it becomes turbulent here, how the jet will look like. Um, OK, maybe I should skip all this. Um, we measured the temperature using spectroscopy. It turned out to be 290K, so it's very close to room temperature. You can see here a hand touching the, <coughs> the, the, uh, touching the plume. Uh, emission spectroscopy shows us uh, that we make OH, we make uh, atomic oxygen. These are the species actually that we are trying to make, especially for many, many applications that we are interested in, and a lot of them are in biomedical. Um, we measured electric field too. <coughs> uh, <coughs> there are many methods. You can use uh, spectroscopy uh, using Stark effect or uh, intensity ratios. You can use a crystal uh, that has like a pocket effect, uh, like BSO uh, crystal, or you can use probes. And if you want to know more, I put here some of the papers that uh, we publish and some other people published at, uh, on the measurement of the electric field. So uh, using the Stark effect, there is a forbidden and the allowed band, and you can, and there is a shift between them. And from that shift, which is delta lambda. It has an equation that relates it to the electric field, and from that you can calculate how much the electric field is. 
at the this electric field will be right at the head of that plume huh, of that bullet that I showed you. And um, you can use also uh, the, the N2, which is nitrogen intensity ratio at two different wavelengths. Uh, this requires knowing a lot of spectroscopy, which maybe some of you uh, don't. But that ratio, <coughs> we know how to calculate it. Uh, and uh, the excitation coefficients here, uh, they are a function of the electric field. So once we measure it, then we can, you know, work back and find how much electric field to make that ratio. And then that way we can calculate the electric field. And this is uh, uh, my student here, my PhD student, now she's a professor in Bangladesh, uh, the, uh, that she uh, published this paper on the measurement. And we measure, as you can see, an average of about 15 kilovolt per centimeter. So that bullet has this very intense electric field at the, at the, at the tip of it which is very useful. Here is with uh, just using simulation here, you can see this is the electric field and as the bullet moves, you see the peak, and of course it dies out, but the peak keeps moving. Huh? This is 89 seconds, it's like 160, 240, as the bullet is propagating and the field goes up to very high. Huh? So this is in unit in kilovolt per centimeter. Um, Okay, if you wanna learn more about this bullets, we published a paper, uh, uh, four of us, uh, a, uh, a Chinese guy, a Russian guy, American guy, and an Australian guy. <laughs> we published the paper, we got together, wrote this paper, uh, by email obviously, uh, we talked to each other, and, we, uh, and this has all the physics you ever wanna know about this guided ionization wave, which I've called the, the, uh, the plasma bullets. Uh, that's why I cannot uh, stay too much on it. Now, uh, I have one PhD student who's gonna finish soon, hopefully, We're doing this really neat experiment. We use this bullet, the plasma, uh, you know, the guided ionization wave from the outside of a, of a chamber. And we don't, we don't put any power in this chamber, no electrode, no power, nothing. Just we put gas that we want inside. And then just by touching this glass, it's made out of glass, if we, t by touching it here, we can ignite a plasma. So we are, we are igniting a plasma by, by a plasma. <laughs> so this is a, a, a very complicated experiment, but the idea is very simple. It's how to ignite a plasma without putting any power in here. And that's very, very useful because electrodes usually have contamination with them, uh, uh, they take space, etc. Uh, but if you can just me, the way I look at this, it's like, it's like a, a, a having a match and a light a fire and, you know, a, a heap of paper like this. So you can, you can ignite a fire by another fire. Huh? So this is the, uh, uh, this, uh, this experiment, and this is how it looks like. If you go to my lab, now you'll see it. And then all you do is just put that plasma pencil here, and then you can ignite a discharge in that chamber that has no electrical connection whatsoever. Here's a picture. Uh, so the plasma bullet is coming from the outside, uh, not from the inside. Coming in here, and this is beautiful, a large volume of plasma that we can use for several applications. Uh, and we looked at it as usual. We always take this fast, uh, 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 using fast photography. We see how it, how it propagates inside. And actually that wave goes, the, uh, the guide ionization wave comes in, and then go, uh, because it has an electric field, right? It's like cap capacitive coupling. The electric field on the other side will start the plasma and it will propagate and fill the whole chamber. Um, okay, so what we use them for? Do you remember about one of my interests is uh, plasma uh, medicine? So we found out that we, uh, this low temperature plasma, we use them for inactivation of bacteria, decontamination of liquid and surfaces for blood coagulation, wound healing, dentistry, dermatology, and even cancer, and that's what we are working on today. I had a student, uh, she graduated last semester. Her thesis one on uh, uh, killing epithelial cancer cells using our plasma, our plasma pencil. Um, she's a postdoc now at the University of Michigan, but she did a lot of work on, on the cancer. So these are the application, and if I, uh, if you remember people who attended my talk last time, I put a whole timeline of this field of 
plasma medicine, which is a biomedical application of plasma, with all the major milestones that happened all over the world uh, uh, in this field. However, all this, all these achievements, you know, that using uh, a plasma for medical application, hopefully, ten years from now, every hospital will will have, you know, a doctor use devices that use plasma. And at the time, people probably will wonder how come it was never done before. But it's, the field is growing and getting to, uh, to clinical trials now in hospitals, so things are, are progressing very well. However, none of this would have happened if we did not develop these devices. Huh? We first ha we had to come up with the atmospheric pressure plasma. When I say we, I don't mean just me. Uh, the community, the, the scientists working in this field all over the world. We had to come uh, to first learn how to make this atmospheric pressure plasma, and then this plasma jets really started this, what I call the rapid growth of plasma medicine because these jets are portable, you can apply them, and that's what probably doctors want to, uh, want to see. Uh, so we have the first decade, that's when things, you know, discovery, and then his growth, and hopefully the third decade will be application in hospitals. So, um, what do I have left here? Okay, so atmospheric pressure, low temperature sources enable the emergence of the field, which I already said. Uh, if you want to learn more about these devices, uh, there's three uh, books that I mentioned <coughs> uh, from 94 to 2008. These books have really nice chapter about all these devices that I mentioned today, okay? Especially this one here. Uh, and also, uh, you can, if you are interested in the biomedical application of plasmas, uh, there are few books out, and there are more coming uh, about the application of, uh, of uh, low temperature plasma in, in medicine. The first book came in 2012, and then two, there are other books that came after that, and there are, I think there are at least two or three books I think that will come out in 2018 from different uh, different uh, investigators. Uh, the conclusion, and I'll finish. So uh, low temperature sources can be designed with various geometries that I showed you. Uh, they provide useful chemistry. <coughs> you can fine tune them. You can um, uh, make them uh, practical and inexpensive for a lot of uh, application, including biomedical. Um, and uh, the jets are especially suited for medical application. Um, Thank you very much.